talk I'm going to do is going to be relatively brief, but I, I gave it the title of uh, Tell It Like Burton, or maybe a little better, um, because I'm hoping to inspire you all to uh, understand Burton's techniques, the techniques I use, which arguably we all got from Peter Burton. In 1958, a then 38 year old journalist and television personality who had a penchant for bow ties, released his first book, and it was entitled Klondike. It was a sprawling 450-page-plus narrative of the 1896 to 1899 period of the gold rush that gave birth to Dawson City. Dawson City was where the author had been born in 1920. Klondike became an international bestseller, and it also made uh, Burton almost a millionaire. It also revolutionized how history in Canada was written. As former Governor General Adrian Clarkson said in 2004, shortly after Pierre Burton's death, Pierre Burton gave us our story. He knew what we had to know about ourselves. To this, his Random House of Canada publisher, John Neal, added, Pierre Burton understood how compelling our history is, and more importantly, was able to bring life to bring it to life and share that fascination with all Canadians. He was a true storyteller. And as one academic historian said, less charitably, Pierre Burton goes to great efforts to make his history interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pierre Burton gave us our story, and I think that one line encapsulates so much, and its essence, it's really what I want to talk about. There are events in history where we can look at things and say there was a time before and then something happened and there was a time after. And an event where there is a clear dividing line. Some say, for example, that Expo in Montreal in 1967 was such an event. It was Canada's 100th birthday and for many it seemed that thereafter the nation found a new international confidence and people sensed that as Canadians anything might be possible. We were ready to take our rightful place on the world stage. Nine years earlier, of course, for the telling of Canada's history, that defining event really was Klondike's publication. Britain's history was unlike any we Canadians were used to reading uh, when it came to reading our nation's history. Here were characters that were seemingly larger than life. They were engaged in this frantic quest for gold in a landscape that was distinctly Canadian and yet so vividly depicted in all its wildness, its beauty, and its lurking hazard. Burton took a Canadian story, one little chapter in Canadian history, and brought it stunningly and realistically to life. Millions of readers around the world bought the book, and it became a staple on the shelves of almost every Canadian who held an interest in history. And Klondike was followed by other histories of equally epic dimension. The National Dream, The Last Spike, recounted the saga of the building of the CPR Railway from sea to sea. The invasion of Canada and the follow-up flames across the border provided a definitive account of the War of 1812 with a studied and very patriotic bow to how it planted the seeds of a growing sense of nationhood. Vimy, which is my personal favorite of Gurdon's works, remains the unparalleled examination of the battle that arguably cemented that sense to a nas of national identity into a reality. In marching as to war, Burton shattered the well-hewn myth of Canada as a peaceful nation that only goes off to war with the greatest of reluctance. In fact, he showed that we had spent most of our history at war. In all of these books, Burton brought his, to the story his masterful skill of writing narrative that enabled us as readers to feel we were back in that particular time, standing alongside those figures who were living in that historical moment. Until It is a skill that changed how Canadian history was written. Until Burton came along, our history had largely been held safe and in splendid isolation within the ivory towers of universities. Academic historians wrote tomes about Canada's past that had a particular defining quality these were books of great seriousness and full of erudite ex examination. And they were often deliberately and stuffy and dry. And they were written not so much for the general audience of Canadian readers, 
but for other academics, and that was the stream of uh, the idea. So rather than taking the form, so they ended up being kind of like a contribution to a debating club. An idea was posited that might explain some historical event, that idea was defended, and then summarized as being probably certain. Other academics would then weigh in on this argument, and the debate would begin on the merit of it. Outside of the academic stream, these books largely attracted no attention, and the average Canadian remained barred from access to their nation's story. In order to understand how they personally fit into that national identity, in our schools, when I was in history, um, it was taught in such a way that it seemed a very long time ago and very far removed from the lives of the young people living in it. And so uh, wonderful to see that changing with the way with what we've seen today with the uh, young kids um, who are so engaged in their history. It wasn't that way when I went to school. Um, and so it's nice to see that changing and it's happening even as well in the academic stream. We're seeing a lot of young academics are writing much more accessible history and they, they understand that there's a need to tell a story. So it takes time for something like Brett Burton's revolutionization of how Canadian history is told for that to filter down, but it is doing so. When Burton forayed into writing Canadian history, he sought to popularize it. He wanted to rest the nation's story out of the ivory tower, place it in the hands of average Canadians. And he did so better than any other writer of his area, era. But how did he do this? What did Burton do that the academics at that time didn't or couldn't do? At the heart of Burton's genius was his innate sense of story. I credit this with his training as a journalist rather than an academic historian. He spent pretty much his whole working life, which continued right up to his death, chasing stories and setting them down in print or explaining them on radio and television programs. When he, first looked, when he first looked at an event, unlike a historian, he was asking, what does this mean? Instead, or he wasn't asking, what does this mean? Instead, he sought first to simply see the story in its full context and to relate that so the Canadians could access the information it entailed. Tell the story, and its meaning will then become evident during the course of that writing and telling. That accords with the old writing adage, write and you will understand what it is you are trying to say. And to tell you that story, you must understand and utilize all the components that go into good narrative writing, whether it be history, memoir, biography, or whatever nonfiction work you turn a hand to. Burton understood this, and that is what enabled him to so effectively write about broad canvas historical events, such as the Klondike Gold Rush or the Battle of Vimy Ridge. But it also enabled him to evocatively write Canadian stories that had a far smaller canvas, like his book The Dion Years, which told the story of the five quintuplets born in 1934, who became this bizarre tourist attraction, which by 1937 had about 3,000 people passing daily through the hospital compound called Quintland, where the, the young children were sequestered by the Ontario government, as it turns out as wards of the state and being cynically turned into symbols of the fortitude and joy of Canadian people during the Great Depression. So what are the actual components of narrative history that enable you to write history like Burton did? I want to look at a very brief piece from my Forgotten Victory. Um, it's February 26, 1945, and this is the opening of the second phase of the Rhineland campaign in which First Canadian Army destroyed the first um, destroyed much of the German army defending the West Bank of the Rhine River. And what was also the first major part of Germany to be invaded by the Western Allies. The second phase was known as Operation Blockbuster. And it opened up this way. At 0430 hours, 2nd Canadian Infantry Division's five battalions advanced across muddy fields through heavy rain. An eerie light was added to the whole scene by searchlights jerry flares, and burning farm buildings. South Saskatchewan regiments, Major George Buchanan wrote. Private Charles Chick Goodman, one of two signalers of Major Free, Fraser Lee's B Company headquarters section, was going forward in a crowded in, in kangaroo, which is an armored personnel carrier. 
The Sasks were on 6th Brigade's left front. Their objective was a pimple-shaped feature dominating the highway running from Calcar to Zatan. In the center, Le Fusilier Montreal had less distance to travel. The French Canadians clung to the outside hulls of the Fort Garry Horse Regiment's A and B squadron tanks. To the right, the Queen's Hill Cannon Highlanders from Winnipeg were in kangaroos. Their objective was more high ground, east of the pimple. Private Goodman was excited. With the other signaler manning the wireless, this 18-year-old was free to look around. Everywhere, kangaroos were been moving. The racket was incredible. En engines roared, tracks clattered, shells shrieked overhead, explosions thundered, machine guns chattered. Goodman had never ridden into an attack, and he was delighted because there was a browning machine gun mounted on a spigot in the kangaroo. Goodman had appropriated the browning and a good supply of belts of 303 and caliber ammunition for it. The SAS reached the Cal Calcar Roche Road quickly. About 100 yards beyond the road, they started up a gradual slope in ever-deepening mud. The men from these uh, soon boarded others passing by when their the ones became a bit bogged down. Intense small arms and mortar fire started coming in. The Germans were firing off dozens of flares. Farm buildings burned on every side. Smoke became so dense that Saskatchewan Lieutenant Colonel Vern Stott signaled back for the anti-aircraft guns to double the rate of tracing fire to provide better directional guidance. Through the smoke, Goodman saw the tree-lined road running from just south of Calcar to Udem. A lot of Germans were marching southward. They were obviously evacuating Calcar. Goodman unleashed the Browning. I kept shooting at them. No idea whether I hit any of them or not. But I think I must have at least frightened some of them. As the SAS closed on the pimple, they came under fire from four 88mm guns on the summit. Captain George Stiles and D Company piled out of the kangaroos and charged the rightmost gun. Capturing it, they removed a demolition charge the German crew had attached to the gun before it could explode. Captain A.J. Robertson, the battalion support company units riding on ground carriers, overran the position, containing the other 3088s and also capturing them attacked. D Company, meanwhile, had been carried on, sweeping through a group of burning buildings. Stiles saw that a number of Germans had taken refuge in their cellars. Suddenly, one kid in civvies, about 15 years old, threw a grenade at our gang and wounded four, Stiles recounted. This was the first instance we encountered of a civilian offering resistance. We let him have it. It was 0650 hours. The SAS were on their objective, looking over the Calcar Zatten Road. B Company section set up inside a farmhouse. Three or four German soldiers lay dead on the main floor. Company Sergeant Major Frank Cunningham disliked using the house. It's going to be a big target, he cautioned Goodman. Let's look at that barn over there. The two men went over to the stoutly built structure which had a lower profile than the big house. Cunningham pointed to a trap door leading to a cellar. We can go down there when the shelling starts up, he said. After the opening the trap door, Goodman paused and peered into the dark interior below. He and Cunningham exchanged glances. Consider it. Better throw up the name down, Cunningham advised. Yeah, but this is a farm. We don't want to kill women and children, Goodman answered. Goodman shouted loudly, Rouse, rouse! Up the stairs came four of the biggest paratroopers I had ever seen. They were huge guys, and the sergeant major and I were both little guys. We started escorting them back to where one of the platoons was holding prisoners. And one of these guys had just kept lagging back. I thought, the son of a bitch is up to something. So I fired a burst of stem gun into the ground in front of him, and he got the message. <laughs> so, we just jump ahead here. First and absolutely essential in writing any kind of passage of history like that, is research. In this section, I drew upon material gathered at a university library in Victoria, material taken from the records of the Library and Archives in Canada, of Canada here in town, from records found at the Director of the Heritage and History Department of National Defense, a Maple Leaf newspaper article sent to me by a relative of a veteran named Jack Golding, and of course, an interview I did with the soldier, Charles Chip Goodman. There are at least six specific sources cited and interwoven with each other to create that narrative that takes place there. Second and most, and also I think equally important, 
I've stood on the exact ground where the Stasis launched that assault, and I've walked up to the pimple. Admittedly, I did this in April, so there was none of the mud that the soldiers dealt with that day. But seeing the ground enables you to understand the challenges and advantages it provides to either defender or attacker. And it also allows you as a Canadian to get that ground into the proper perspective. Um, I often read people describing Verrier Ridge and attacks on them that will refer to soldiers scaling Verrier Ridge. Well, Verrier Ridge ascends over more than a kilometer of ground, very level, I think it gains a height of 30 meters in that time. You don't scale very rich, you stroll up it. <laughs> or if you're a soldier, you've got your back of burden and you try to run up it as fast as you can, but you're not scaling it. And that's where seeing the ground allows you to really get a sense of what it's like. So no matter what you are writing, it's likely to take place somewhere. And by visiting and studying that place, you come to understand better what it is you're writing about. Research in hand, the next, next task is to take it all and turn it into an engaging narrative that holds the reader's attention. This is an exercise not entirely on all the research one has gathered, but winnowing out of it the material that is most compelling and moves the story forward to a conclusion. For the description of the passage I read to you on the Saskatoon uh, or Saskatchewan Rifle a Regiment. I had probably uh, about 800 pages of material I could have drawn upon. I could have easily written an entire book about just that one half hour or so of attack. Um, when armies march, one of the things they do is they generate paper. Uh, they generate that in amazing quantities, and the bulk of material I had available was, was vast. And you end up losing hardly any of it because you can only take a certain amount to make that particular piece of the story, which of course is a story that's wrapping into every other story that you're telling in there that is ultimately the story that is the book. So the trick is to precisely select what will create that compelling scene. And I won't go through every detail that I hit upon, but they advance, you notice they advance through rain across muddy fields, under the eerie light of searchlights that were bouncing off the clouds, of the German flares that were rising into the sky, and the burning farm buildings that were around them as they went forward. There was the noise of the machines carrying the soldiers forward. And there was Chick Goodman, the excited 18-year-old, almost really a boy soldier, who was there. Readers of the book have met Chip before, and so they would know that he had just turned 18, uh, literally that month. He had lied about his age to get into the army when he was 16 years old, because he was the oldest son of a family in, in Nova Scotia. And they had, their husband, the, the father, had abandoned the, the family, and so he went to war to be able to make a salary that he could send home. And the recruiting officers knew the family's condition, and they accepted the lot. Uh, and so off Chip goes to uh, war at 16 years old. And he's a young man with a brown machine gun and lots of ammunition for it. And this is his one and only chance he's ever going to have to fire something like that at the enemy. So he is right into the idea. And he, when I interviewed him, he described exactly what he was thinking. And I was sitting with a, a man in his early 80s. And I was transported back to an 18-year-old and the 18-year-old's enthusiasm. Uh, he, Chip is one of those great interviews um, where he can, he can go back in time himself and feel not only, the, not only describe what he was doing, but the emotions that were went with it. And I couldn't at the same time just stay with Chip Goodman for the whole part because that's too much on one particular character. So you shift to George Stiles and D Company tackling the four 88 millimeter guns and then pushing into the burning farmsteads only to have a German kid in civilian dress throw a grenade at them the wounds four men and the survivors cut that kid down. You switch to B Company and back to Chip Goodman again and there's himself and Company Sergeant Major Frank Cunningham weighing the pros and cons of setting up in that farmhouse. And then they go over to that basement in the, 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 the barn and the 
cellar uh, trap door and they lift up the trap door and they think we should throw some grenades down there. But what do they do? They hesitate because they're afraid they would kill some civilians. So then he yells, rouse, rouse, rouse. <coughs> Out come these four paratroopers, big paratroopers. And Chick and Cunningham really are small men. Chick is about five foot five today. His nickname derived from the fact that he was so skinny when he joined up that the other Canadian recruits at his recruiting depot said that his legs looked like those of a chicken. Hence, he became Chick. But Chick has an automatic weapon, a stem gun, and he uses it to ensure control over the prisoners. And then the battle between the Saskatoons and the uh, Germans draws to a conclusion. As much as possible, the scene is depicted as if you were positioned like a camera on the shoulder of the various soldiers we move between in a very short piece of writing. We don't get a lot of sense of who the soldiers are, but not too much of us, but we get enough to take us away and to give us the action. With B Company, they are, of course, soldiers that readers have met earlier in the book, so that backstory doesn't get repeated. We see them in action, and we hear two of them talk to each other. And that's a really important thing in history. As much as possible, you dig around and you try and get conversation. You, what, you know, you don't make it up. You get what they say was said. Or sometimes you, you know, like I get the, your, the operation logs and the radio logs are often very good because you can actually hear what the people were saying to each other through, through the radio. You get that kind of material and you're able to use it in a conversational way. Dialogue takes us back and makes us see these people as living entities, not just a bunch of little stick figures running around on, on the uh, landscape. And they talk like soldiers do. Um, you know, they use obscenities and, and things, different types of language, um, slang. Um, I, all too often I read history where it's so stilted what these people are saying, you think, <laughs> you know, especially not soldiers. You know, um, like they'll say, "What the heck?" instead of "What the hell?" You know, in 1944, in the middle of a gun battle, somebody's going to say, "What the heck, Captain?" <laughs> you know, um, probably not. Um, so we see them in action, and we see, hear them talk to each other. We're also given details of what the land and weather in which they operated is like, and there's that dichotomy that I built into that scene particularly of the German kid with the grenade and his wounding of the soldiers and his death versus that cautious humanity of Goodman and Cunningham in not chucking the grenade into the basement and then being confronted with the startling surrender of those paratroops. And we switch from that immediately in the scene I didn't read of killing at a distance of retreating Germans by the Zasks calling in artillery on a, on a column of Germans that were attempting to get to the rear. So we see various aspects of the war all happening in a very small piece of geography in a very small period of time. And it's deliberately written that way. I wanted to show how rapidly the combat experience shifts from one situation to another and how soldiers have to respond to those shifts immediately and without pause or they're not going to survive. War is chaos and I'm always trying to build that chaos into, into my writing so that people understand it. That the moment you go over the top, the battle that you anticipated is not the one you end up fighting. So those are the keys to this kind of narrative and they're the keys that Burton played so well. And I've tried to highlight here some of them. Exhaustive research, the application of storytelling techniques of scene setting, character development, description of characters in action, and the application of dialogue and where you get it, internal thoughts, where you can apply them, either through the interviewing of characters, or drawing on their diaries, or their letters, or whatever else you can get your hands on that gives you that opportunity. You don't fictionalize the narrative history, so it's a lot more complicated, and I also write novels. It's a lot more complicated to do this sort of storytelling than to sit down and write a novel or a short story. The reader's giving the facts, but also the story. 
And a story told as well as Burton might have done, or possibly even better, is what you want to set out to do. And thank you. Thank you.